He's ruled Kazakhstan for almost three decades. Now Nursultan Nazarbayev has suddenly resigned, surprising many. But does that signal a shift in this Central Asian state? And how is it being viewed regionally and globally? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. He's the only leader many Kazakhs have ever known and the first and only president of an independent Kazakhstan. Now, 78-year-old Nasultan Nazarbayev has unexpectedly stepped down, but although he's brought his 30-year tenure as president to an end, he's not giving up power. He's keeping the status of both leader of the nation and chief of the country's security council. The Speaker of the Upper House of Parliament, Kasim Jomat Tokayev, has been sworn in to serve the rest of Nazarbayev's term, which ends at the uh, end of next year. Some human rights organisations have criticised him of suppressing dissent and sidelining the opposition. Here's what the President had to say as he told the nation that he was stepping down. I'm addressing you today, as I've always done in the most important moments in the history of our state, which we are building together. But my address today is special. I made an uneasy decision to step down as president of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is an oil-rich country in Central Asia. It's the size of Western Europe with an ethnically diverse population but of just 18 million people. It gained independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, but it's remained a close ally of Russia, which borders it to the north. China lies to the east. Kazakhstan provides a crucial transport hub for Chinese products heading to Europe. And Kazakhstan has kept a delicate balance between its neighbors and the west, especially uh, the US, with which it provides a supply route into Afghanistan. Let's bring in our panel for today from Almaty in Kazakhstan. We're joined via Skype uh, by Yevgeny Jovtis, a human rights activist. From Paris, we have Alex Melikishvili, who researches Kazakhstan as an analyst at the financial risk consultancy IHS Market. And from Washington, D.C., we're joined by William Courtney, who served as U.S. ambassador to Kazakhstan uh, from 1992 to 1994. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Alex, uh, in Paris, if we can start uh, with you first. So, Nasultan Nazarbayev giving up the presidency, but not giving up power. He will, for some time yet, be pulling the levers uh, of power, Wizard of Oz style, from, from somewhere off stage. Yes, indeed, uh, uh, it's correct. He retains uh, a number of very important positions. He retains a lifelong uh, chairmanship of the Security Council, which was significantly empowered uh, last year. He also retains a membership in the Constitutional Council, um, and that allows him to sort of for, uh, retain formal levers of, of influence over political processes in the country. Um, so that's very important to bear in mind. At the same time, we now have a, a, a contours of what uh, is likely to be, a, you know, preliminary contours of what is likely to be a dynastic succession um, in place. Um, I'm running a bit uh, ahead of time, but uh, I have to tell you that uh, today's unanimous vote by uh, Senate to uh, essentially make uh, uh, President Nazarbayev's eldest daughter, Dariga Nazarbayev, who has been a senator uh, since uh, 2016, to become a, a speaker of the Senate. That's a very crucial development because it uh, signals the likely dynastic uh, transition, which is coached and cloaked in constitutional terms. OK, we'll, we'll come on and talk about what happens next in, in Kazakhstan and who takes power in just a few minutes. Uh, ambassador Courtney in, in Washington, uh, during your tenure as the US ambassador to Kazakhstan, you must have met uh, Nasultan Nazarbayev more than a few times. Uh, what did you make of him? Uh, President Nazarbayev is probably the most skilled of the early Soviet, uh, post-Soviet leaders. Uh, he certainly uh, achieved an enormous amount in a number of areas. Kazakhstan was the first country to give up all of its strategic nuclear weapons after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Kazakhstan attracted the first huge Western oil investment of any country in the former Soviet space. President Nazarbayev advocated policy of ethnic tolerance right from the beginning. 
That turned out to be a, a wise policy. He's pursued good, close relations with Russia and China. Uh, that's very helpful. And finally, President Nazarbayev, his national strategy was to open Kazakhstan to the outside world to be a leader in international diplomacy. For example, Kazakhstan was the first post-Soviet state to chair the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. So there are an enormous number of achievements in the Nazarbayev era. That sounds great. If only every country could have a leader like him. Why then the negativity around uh, Nazarbayev and, and, and his rule of, of Kazakhstan? Why all the criticism? Well, in recent years, uh, the authorities in Kazakhstan have become uh, more authoritarian, really repressive in some respects. So recently, for example, Kazakhstan has been jailing journalists, been locking up uh, peaceful demonstrators, uh, not allowing political parties. Uh, Nazarbayev's Nur Otan political party is the only one in the Majlis, the, the lower house of parliament. Uh, so these are signs of really, rather than opening up, moving toward democracy, kind of moving away from democracy. So hopefully this transition will allow more opportunities for political discussion in Kazakhstan. That would be stabilizing, and the Kazakhstani people clearly want to have that. Yevgeny Jovtis, uh, do you think that that's going to happen, that this may be an opportunity for opening up uh, further uh, political discussion in Kazakhstan? To what extent is, is President Nazarbayev personally responsible for Kazakhstan's poor human rights record? Uh, first of all, I want to add uh, something about his powers after retirement. He is still keeping the control over the uh, Nuratan political party, which is the only uh, party represented in the local uh, legislatures and in the executive branches of power. Uh, there are two other parties in the parliament, but they are rather spoilers than the real opposition or something like that. Uh, Mr. Nazarbayev considers himself as a, uh, and compare himself with Lee Kuan Yew, with the Deng Xiaoping, with Ataturk as the constructor and builder of the first independent Kazakh state in the history. And uh, it makes him uh, to feel that he is the leader of the nation as it is put in the constitution. And uh, to, to move forward not paying too much attention to some kind of political pluralism, democracy, rule of law. But the problem, from my point of view, lies uh, in the years long ago, because after the collapse of the former Soviet Union, uh, there was the redistribution of the wealth, of the private property starts to, be, to emerge. And uh, the ruling elite and the representatives were the key beneficiaries of this process of privatization. And that's why they are very vulnerable, and they need to keep power and to control all structures of power. And this is what he was doing. And this is the explanation why this crackdown on political opposition, independent media, and civic protesters are going on and even strengthening. But so how easy is it, um, uh, Yevgeny, for you? He's speaking to us from Al Almaty. How easy it is, is it for you to, to, to uh, say the, the critical things that, that you are saying about the government? Uh, I uh, agree with my friend Mr. Courtney that Nazarbayev is a wise ruler. He is not, uh, he created soft authoritarian rule. Uh, he did not, uh, let's say, uh, uh, repress directly the people who are, are outspoken or critical, and uh, he allows certain kind of criticism and uh, there are independent journalists, there are oppositioners, and so on. But they are excluded from the, systematic, from the system, from the political system. He is maneuvering. If he sees any kind of real threat and any leadership skills or mobilization potential, he is cracking down. If it is not, it's allowed to speak critically. I testified before the U.S. Congress or EU Parliament that he allows to do this. He is not, uh, he's doing it very intelligently. Alex Melikashvili in, in, in Paris. Uh, the president has another, uh, another year, or just over a, a year, year and a half even, of his term, his latest term to go. Why now? Why step down so suddenly now? Well, my understanding of it is that he wants to oversee the order, orderly, um, and as I mentioned to you, 
cloaked in the constitutional uh, uh, rules uh, transition. Um, so, uh, and part of it has to do with, with the fact that he uh, wants to oversee the transition in a sense that, first of all, you now have uh, Kasim Jomat Tokayev, uh, who, uh, according to the Constitution, was a speaker, uh, spe speaker of the Senate who assumed the interim presidency, the interim presidency until the April of 2020. Um, and uh, uh, essentially, uh, then the most important part will start as we approach the April 2020 presidential elections, because you know, depending on uh, who appears in the mainstream coverage of Kazakh media, this will be a really good barometer of who will be the primary candidate for the presidency. Um, Tokayev is untested. You know, he's uh, not necessarily experienced with regard to uh, handling uh, domestic matters. And I have to remind everyone that uh, um, just in February, uh, pr pr then Prime Minister Bakhijat Sagintayev's uh, government was sacked in an unprecedented manner by uh, President Nazarbayev precisely because of the situation related to uh, the uh, uh, sort of sporadic uh, social and economic unrest that we're witnessing in Kazakhstan. So it's important to bear in mind this sort of tentative date um, of April uh, 2020, which is when um, the next presidential elections are supposed to take place, unless, of course, they are uh, shifted further uh, down, the, uh, down the road. Um, uh, from this point of view, as I mentioned to you earlier, you know, the candidacy of uh, uh, Dariga Nazarbayeva uh, is becoming more likely, in my opinion, because of the fact that there are indications pointing to this, which I mentioned to you, which is the fact that uh, uh, just today, unanimously, yeah. Senate uh, elected her to be Speaker of the Senate. This means that according to the Constitution, again, if something happens to Tokayev in the interim, in the interim until April of 2020, According to the Constitution, Dariga Nazarbayeva takes over. So, uh, um, what about? I mean, are there any other contenders uh, that, that, that we that perhaps waiting on on the sidelines? You mentioned, all right, Dariga, we're talking about here, who would become president if anything happens to to the gentleman who is now the interim president, who was the speaker. What about the man who was appointed uh, prime Correct. minister when he sacked the government? You know. You, uh, this is an excellent question, because you hit the nail on the head. You know, the thing is, um, Kazakhstan has vast and heterogeneous ruling circles, um, which include a number of people who most likely harbor presidential ambitions. And it will be extremely interesting to see how the intra-elite dynamic unfolds as we approach April of next year, you know, um, because depending on uh, the coherence within the elite, we will see the indications um, uh, that can be manifested in many different ways, including uh, potentially destabilizing uh, uh, for key sectors in the country. Ambassador Courtney, if, if Alex is right and, and, and the daughter, Dariga, is being manoeuvred towards uh, the, the, the presidency, how would, would people in Kazakhstan feel about that? How do they view her? Well, I believe Alex is correct in his analysis. Uh, Dariga Nazarbayeva does not really have independent political power herself. She's not widely seen as a prominent political leader. So this is really an effort to stage manage a a dynastic uh, succession, uh, possibly with uh, her being uh, pres elected president next year. It's even possible that Ambassador Takayev will resign as president before the election so that Dadiga can succeed him and then be running as an incumbent. President Nazarbayev has a 48-year-old nephew who's deputy head of the security service in Kazakhstan. He could be the person who would come after Dadiga Nazarbayeva in terms of President Nazarbayev's uh, conception for a succession. There is, as Alex pointed out, increased public unease now in Kazakhstan. There are higher expectations for performance of government and for more economic reforms to improve people's lives, and those reforms have not uh, taken place. Uh, so this is probably going to be a time when, uh, while there's interim presidency, 
Uh, there are going to be debates and discussions among a lot of the ethnic Kazakh elites uh, in Kazakhstan. There are a number of interesting candidates. Uh, ambassador Tasma Gambetov, who's the Kazakhstani ambassador in Moscow, would be one potential candidate. Karim Masimov, who has been presidential uh, administration head and prime minister, is another potential candidate, although he's an ethnic uh, Uyghur. Um, prime Minister Mamin currently would be a potential candidate. Uh, but there needs to be a more open political discussion uh, in Kazakhstan. And Mr. Uzhovtas, who has been a courageous leader uh, for more open politics and respect for human rights in Kazakhstan, probably will play a role in that discussion. A, f a few years ago, Ambassador, many people were talking about the fact that uh, um, uh, there may be this dynastic succession. And then Dariga appeared to fall out of, out of favor uh, for a while. I mean, you must have met her uh, uh, many times. I I've met her a couple of times, too. She doesn't strike me as the kind of person who would be happy uh, to be daddy's puppet. Uh, she is. She has not carved an independent uh, political career of her own. She's not someone who's regarded by a large number of Kazakhstanis as a popular person. Her father, President Azerbaijan, is widely respected and, and liked by many Kazakhstanis. But dynastic politics in Kazakhstan may be something that is behind the stage of development that Kazakhstan is now in. Kazakhstan is classified by the World Bank as an upper middle income country. Countries that reach that level and go further tend to become more open, more pluralistic. Probably there needs to be a, a new generation of folks who are more reformist, particularly in economic reforms and political reforms. Whether that will be allowed to take place or not is unclear. But if there is going to be positive change, the first thing that ought to be done is to release imprisoned journalists, stop arresting peaceful demonstrators, and allow independent political parties to develop. Evgeny, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, that that's something you would agree with wholeheartedly. Uh, first of all, I want to add something to what uh, others said. I think that when we're talking about the future succession, we have to be very, very clear that it will be not the succession of the same president with, the, with its powers. It will be the president with the first president behind the scene, where Mr. Nazarbayev will control and manage all uh, decision-making process. Secondly, it's clear that this president, the new president in uh, next year, should uh, provide security. It's because the key role, the key goal, is to provide security to the ruling elite, to the president and his family. And it will determine uh, who will be and in what fashion and how. Uh, at the same time, I agree that the situation in Kazakhstan, economically and social, no matter what other uh, the marks of the World Bank, the situation is more and more tense. There are problems with the uh, economical development, where the problems with the life living of the people, and there, uh, and there are a lot of expectations. But it needs certain political reforms and especially uh, establishment of the rule of law, because the country is totally corrupted, and there is no independent judiciary. And it uh, put the, uh, let's say so, the challenges to this new uh, form president, who will be the functioner, behind whom there will be the leader of the nation, Mr. Nazarbayev, but who have to take certain steps to improve the situation. And it create uh, certain windows of opportunities, but I'm not sure that this uh, could happen. There are a lot of factors which are influencing the whole process. Uh, Alex, I, I know you wanted to come in when we were talking about uh, Dariga, the daughter, falling out of favour and, and, and coming back again. Um, so please have, have your say. But I, I want to, to ask you uh, to what extent President Nazarbayev is, is getting ahead of, uh, of building resentment in the country of, over declining economic growth and, uh, and the corruption that Yevgeny was talking about. I mean, these are very important uh, problems, you know, because uh, uh, social stability is something that is e extremely important for Nazarbayev. And uh, the problem with, this, with the situation as it is kind of stacked up right now is the fact, is the fact that there is a fundamental divergence between how um, now former President Nazarbayev may conceive of his role as 
uh, Lee Kuan Yew was mentioned here, uh, who he admires a lot. Uh, Deng Xiaoping was mentioned here. You know, but uh, uh, Kazakhstan is neither Singapore uh, uh, nor China. You know, so what I'm trying to say is that he's, uh, he's stabilizing influence on the Kazakh ruling elite um, that he envisions for himself by being in the background and being sort of stage managing everything and most likely providing overall guidance to Tokayev, for instance, to the interim president. Um, uh, in, the short, I mean, in the short term, uh, it's viable. But even in the medium term, given the fact that in July, uh, uh, Mr. Nazarbayev will turn 79, you know, this raises questions. You know, in other words, his ability to, to continue to have a, a stabilizing influence over Kazakh uh, uh, elite uh, is limited, okay. you know, and this raises a whole host of issues, okay. um, you know, related to, uh, re related to internal stability uh, and so on. Okay. Um, we're rapidly running out of time here. Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Courtney, um, let's discuss Kazakhstan's neighbors. Uh, uh, Alex, uh, they're talking about, about China and, and uh, in particular, but what, what about Russia? Uh, here, the Kremlin making it quite clear that they were uh, consulted or told about the president's surprise resignation before he went on television and made that that national address. What what will uh, Russia be making of this? Uh, well, let me clarify. This is not really a surprise. President Nazarbayev has been hinting at this uh, for several months. The Russia will want to know whether Kazakhstan is going to continue to pursue the moderate policies it has pursued thus far, ethnic tolerance, which is particularly important because of about a fifth of the country, uh, the population, uh, are ethnic uh, Slavs, uh, Russians especially, but also Ukrainians and Belarusians. Uh, so the Kremlin will want to know that their interests will be protected. Uh, the Kremlin will also want to know that Kazakhstan will continue to participate in the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, the Kremlin will want to know that it can still have access to the Baikonur Cosmodrome, which it uses for a lot of uh, space launches. Uh, so there are a lot of issues there that are important for Russia, even more so than for China in some respects. Uh, but Russia is unlikely at this point, given the um, aggression that is conducted in Ukraine and the high political costs of that, including sanctions, Russia is unlikely at this point to use coercion to try to threaten Kazakhstan. Okay. Um, Yevgeny, I, I need a, a fairly brief answer from you, if you can give me one, because the, the, the news is fast approaching. But as a, as a human rights activist in Kazakhstan, uh, what do you think uh, Nazarbayev's legacy will be? Uh, I think that, first of all, it will be the uh, more or less stable state structure, more or less develop, developed uh, market economy, and the infrastructure of market economy, but very poor record in the sphere of political rights and civil freedoms. And this is the, the problem for me as a human rights defender promoting these rights and freedoms. Yevgeny, I mean, are you hopeful that things are, are going to change or not? Uh, I think that the challenges which the country is facing, geopolitical, security, corruption, uh, economical problems, they are pushing the ruling elite to make certain steps towards modernization, institutionalization, and some liberalization. That's to a certain extent, I'm moderately optimistic. They have to go forward. Okay. To what extent, at what speed, how, we will see either this year or next year when the elections will take place. Gentlemen, there we must end our discussion. Many thanks indeed uh, for being with us. Uh, Yevgeny Jovtis, Alex Megalikashvili. And uh, William Courtney, uh, thank you also for watching the programme. Don't forget you can see it again at any time just by going to the website aljazeera.com. Uh, and for further discussion, join us at our Facebook page, which you'll find at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for being with us. We'll see you again. Bye for now.